Joy in the city. Joy in your life. Joy in your family. And joy everywhere in Jesus' name. GCK Authority has announced the next level move. From the land of honor and integrity comes two in one GCK live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria, the Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Professionals, titled Recharge to Excel, December 27, 2022, at 0600 hours GMT, all broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms with Jonathan White, our guest music minister. GCK, the gospel to every creature. Praise the Lord. Everybody, good evening again. Are you doing okay? If you are here the first day and yesterday, we had a great time together. And tonight is going to be wonderful. Everybody say wonderful. wonderful. And for those of you in the other, on the other campuses and you are joining us now, I welcome every one of you and it's going to be a great time today. I wish I could touch your life right there and we could be together. And the subject we're looking at today, I wish you were able to come over here and you know, pitch me a little and say, what topic is this? And then we can have a nice talk together. And for those of you who are here tonight, when I finish, I'll be available. You want to talk and discuss and you want to debate, you want to pro con everything, I'm available and we're going to have a good time together. <laughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. We're going to have a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you at this time and we bless your name. We thank you because you brought us together for a good thing. And we pray that everybody today here and in all the other campuses and youth camps everywhere, we pray, oh Lord, you touch every life in Jesus' name. Bless us together, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can sit down, please. Tonight we're looking at this subject. When I announce the subject, you are going to wonder about the words that are put together. The topic is paradigm of beauty. Paradigm of beauty. I'll come to that word paradigm later. Because that word may not be very familiar to everybody. But the word beauty, what is it? That which delights the senses. That which exalts and pleases the mind. When we talk of beauty, we're talking of qualities pleasing to the moral sense. You might call it physical loveliness. When we say something is beautiful, number one, it's lovely. It's fair. It's comely. It's agreeable. We say it is good looking. And when we talk about a boy or a man, we say handsome. Or we say, we, we, you know, among us, we just pose for pictures. And we say, this boy, this girl is photogenic. Or we say, he's refined. Or we say, she's attractive. Or we say, every time I see him, it's always neat. We say, presentable. Or we say, noble. All those words, as we bring them together, we're describing what we mean when we say beauty or beautiful. Now, this other word, paradigm. What does that word mean? Simply this. An example serving as a pattern. When we say paradigm, we're talking about an example that serves as a pattern. There are some other synonyms we can bring together as we look at this word, paradigm, a model. Or we say it's just a pattern. Or we call it a blueprint. Somebody will say a masterpiece. Or it's uh, just a prototype. When you bring those things together, actually if you check up in your dictionary, you might have the paradigm of virtue. But the one we're considering tonight is the paradigm of beauty. And if you 
put together all those pieces I threw at you now, you will see that what we're talking about is a model, a pattern, a typical example of beauty for other people to emulate or duplicate. You say, can we be talking about beauty? When we're, we're talking about morals, we're talking about having some change, we're talking about civilization, we're talking about the culture in which we live, and we talk about beauty. Ah, you need to understand, God loves beautiful things. And God actually created beauty. If you look at the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, verse, 20, verse 31, and God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. That means he made everything beautiful. In fact, there's a verse of the Bible that says exactly that. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, reading from verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. It says, he has made everything beautiful. You never heard that before you thought we're supposed to be ugly when we come near Christians. You think we're supposed to be ugly, unsightly when we come near the people that carry Bible about. But it, the Bible says, He, Almighty God, has made everything beautiful. You say, but look at the things we see around us. Look up here. Do you see? It is when man, fallen man, touches something. That man debases that thing. Look at the flower before you touch it. Beautiful, lovely, sightly, very good. It is when man, with his falling nature, when he takes what God has made, and then he defaces it, and debases it, and destroys it, and defiles it, that becomes another thing. Look at this. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29, Lo, this only have I found, that God has made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. That's our problem. God made everything good, everything beautiful, everything wonderful, everything lovely, but man has sought out many inventions. As we talk about the paradigm of beauty tonight. And we're examining this subject, a model, an example, a pattern of beauty for all the people to emulate and for all the people to duplicate. I have three simple points I'm going to share with you. Number one, deceptive beauty. Number two, desirable beauty. Number three, dignifying beauty. Number one, deceptive. Number two, desirable. Number three, dignifying. Let's come to number one, deceptive beauty. Before I read some important scriptures to you, some important passages of scripture, I want you to join me now. I'm going to set up some panels. And uh, the panels are going to help us. They're going to view and they're going to examine. They're going to evaluate. They're going to appreciate beauty. And these different panels I set up, they're going to give us their verdict on our style, on our approach, on our public appearance. Follow me. The first panel here is the panel excuse me, made up of God and the holy angels. And imagine, visualize, that panel is over there. I have another panel. And this panel now, they are men and women selected from Sodom. What a panel. And here, there. I have the third panel. And it's a panel of concerned, upright mothers. They have daughters, and they have children. They're concerned about their society. And we set them up as a panel. That's my third panel. The next panel is a panel of Satan and the unclean spirits. Because they do have a say in what goes on in the world. 
they appeared in the garden of Eden after God has created man and put man in the garden of Eden. So, Satan is not a stranger to everything that is going on in the world. In fact, one day, God was asking Satan, he said, where have you been? What are you doing? What's your activity? Oh, he said, I've been busy going up and down to and fro in the earth. I'm just looking at everybody. I've set up a panel. I'm looking at what they're doing. I'm looking at the activities, so we cannot leave him out. Satan and his fallen angels, that is the fourth panel. I cannot leave out our stars, the four stars, and the entertainers. And they have a panel. They are, you know, visualize in your mind, that's a panel here. Now, as we look at our beauty and dressing and public appearance we ask panel one panel two panel three panel four panel five to observe to view to examine to evaluate to appreciate to approve or disapprove and as these uh, individuals pass boys and girls and they dress their normal way and they appear their normal way. The panel is looking at each one. There is a conclusion we can reach. Without you being a pastor, a preacher, or somebody who has read the Bible from cover to cover, there's a conclusion we can all make. Their evaluation and decisions will be different. Am I right? That's where we are. You need to understand that the way we appear and the way we comport ourselves and the public appearance that we make you judge it a particular way the first panel god and the holy angels there's a way they judge our appearance and the panel of men and women from sodom because of the lifestyle they used to and because of the lifestyle they promote there is a kind of decision they also will take and a verdict they will pass on you, on me, in their panel. And these concerned mothers who have had some of their teenage daughters becoming pregnant, who have had some of their minors, even children, some of their children less than 10 years of age being raped, and who have had the unfortunate experience of their children. The brother in the family raping the sister in the family. And who have had the unfortunate experience and confusion. They don't know what they're going to do because one of their daughters got pregnant for one of the boys living at home with them, a relative. These concerned mothers, when we also pass before them as we dress, as we appear publicly, they should they have a decision and a verdict. And then Satan, of course, that wants the ruin and the destruction of man, of civilization, of everything beautiful, wants everything defiled and destroyed. Of course, they also have their own decision and their verdict. And the last panel, the pop stars, the entertainers, the drug addicts, and the people, all they want is just the chair of the audience. And we see them on billboards. We see them over the television. We see them almost everywhere. And it appears whatever they do, even if, if other people do it, we say, why is he doing that? But if a footballer does something, ah, he must be right. If I do it, it must be wrong. If you do it, it must be wrong. And if I, if, if I came over here tonight and I plaited my hair and I stood before you, some of you will stand, will look at me and say, is he going to preach to us? Not in this place. Not on this campus. I am not going to listen to him. You'll stand up and you'll walk out. If a footballer came here and he plaited his hair and he stood there and he say, hey! Everybody will cheer because what is wrong for me, what you will not allow me to do, you allow him to do it. But why? 
Why do you judge us by a different standard? If it is wrong for me, why is it right for him? And the panel of pop stars and entertainers, they're going to have their own verdict. My question to you is this. Which panel will approve of your style of dressing? Which panel will approve of your public appearance? Obviously, one panel will approve of you out of the five. But the panel of God and the holy angels, will that panel approve of your dressing, of your public appearance? The panel of concerned mothers, upright mothers, will they approve of your dressing and your public appearance? Who do you have on your side? Is it the panel of Satan and unclean spirits and fallen angels? That's the only panel you lean on. That's the only panel you say, after all, I have a pass mark from this panel. Which panel approves of your appearance? Is it the panel of men and women, selected men and women from Sodom and Gomorrah? Or is it the panel of pop stars and entertainers? Now, I told you that this first point is deceptive beauty. In Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23, looking at verse 27 and verse 28, here Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Wait a minute. We're talking about Jesus Christ. He belongs to the first panel. And that tells you immediately now what we're reading about. The kind of dressing and the kind of public appearance, if it fits into what I'm reading now, the first panel, that's God and the holy angels with Jesus Christ as part of that team, part of that panel, that panel disapproves of this deceptive beauty. Look at it. In verse 27, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, that means graveyard tombs, which appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Ah, there's something here now. It is my inner personality, my inner thought, my inner life that dictates actually my outward appearance. If I'm filled with unclean thoughts, if I'm filled with unclean imagination, if I have something evil in me, if I have something destructive within me, and I want to destroy other people, what happens on the outside is the reflection of what is coming from inside. And Jesus Christ in the first panel, he said, you're full of uncleanness and of men's bones. You are destructive and you are deadly. In verse 28, even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Why don't I think about this then? What is the motivation for my dressing? What is the motivation for my public appearance? Who am I trying to please? Am I like uh, somebody that is like this, somewhere like this, another place? Am I a person that has been shaken by the wind? And wherever the wind is blowing, that is where I tend to be. Because I do not have stamina, something within me that says, here is a principle, here is where to stand. And there is where I stand, whatever wind may blow. And whatever your opinion may be, and whatever your evaluation may be, I want to appear right to the first panel. God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the holy angels. Now, as you look at 1 Kings chapter 21, there is a woman here, and uh, this uh, woman has uh, a name. And I've been, I've been coming across quite a lot of people. I don't know why. Before, uh, uh, 
First, first Kings, First Kings chapter 21. If you have opened it, just put your finger there and look up at me. I, I like to look at people's faces when I talk. I don't like to talk to their, to their head. I like to talk to them face to face. Now, you see this uh, woman that I'm going to read about to you. I've been watching. Because the names I find in the Bible, I find Joseph. And if I say, if you are Joseph, let me even try. How many of you, Joseph, can you raise up your hand if you are Joseph? I have somebody there. I have in the Bible, I have Samuel. Anybody Samuel here? Can you raise up your hands? Okay, I have somebody there. And then I have Stephen in the Bible. Um, I, I want to, is any Stephen here at all? Stephen, okay, I have somebody there. I, I'm looking for Mary now. There's a Mary in the Bible. Anybody call Mary here? Where are you? That she there. You know, all these people you find, but I've been looking, I've been looking. I'm looking for somebody they call Jezebel. Where are you? Why do parents refuse to call their daughters Jezebel? Think about it. Think about it. Why? Because it's a name. Like John. Like Jeremiah. Like Joseph. Like Stephen. Like Mary. Like Salome. And we have all these names. Even in a little congregation like this, you have the names repeated. Why is it our parents refuse to call their daughters Jezebel? They're giving us information. They're teaching us something. They're telling us something that they don't want their daughters. I'm not even talking of church-going mothers. I'm talking about any mother anywhere in America, in Europe, and in Nigeria and in Ghana, and in Africa, and in Asia. I've traveled all around. I have not met a single Jezebel yet. Why do parents all over the world refuse to call their daughters Jezebel? Because these mothers, you may not know, they belong to this panel of concerned, upright mothers. And he said, if there is a name, I'm not going to give my child, I'm not going to give my child the name Jezebel. And, um, you know, there are 12 apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have Matthew there, and you have Peter there, you have John, you have Philip, and you have all these others. And there's one other name there, Judas. Judas, are you here? Why do mothers and fathers refuse to give these names to their children? Did you ever think about that? Did you know that all these panels were set up here? Do you know that the panel that God belongs to and the panel that the concerned mothers belong to, they do not want to give those names to any of us children because they know what those names represent. What they symbolize, what they stand for. Look at this now. In 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 25, it says, But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom, who is this? Tell me out loud. Those who don't have Bible, don't let them know that you don't have Bible. What they say, say to you. Who is this? Jezebel. Whom Jezebel is wife, stirred up, did a lot of evil. And uh, this uh, Jezebel, now look, although we do not have the name Jezebel, we might have the character of Jezebel. Although we do not bear the name Judas, we might have the character of Judas Iscariot. Although we do not bear the name Jezebel, we might have the dressing and the public appearance and the indecency and the obscene appearance of Jezebel. What we're saying is cancel the name, cancel the act. Say no to the name and say no to the appearance. Say no to that name and say no to the practice. Say no to that name and say no to anything that marks up the habit, the lifestyle, the appearance of Jezebel. Uh, this uh, woman again appeared in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 20. In Revelation chapter 2, 
verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest, you permit, you allow. You give freedom to that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. You see something here. It says the influence of Jezebel. That's actually the thing that matters, your influence. The influence of your appearance, the impact you have on the web of relationships that encircle you, that go around you. It is the impact or the influence you have on them that actually matters. Let's think about it together. Let's say, for example, a student uh, lady will decide that this morning it looks like it's humid and hot. And why is the condition like this? In fact, and I must go to class today. And what am I going to do? And I'm not going to, you know, because I, I always sweat. And I don't like, you know, body odor is a bad thing. Even when you try to clean up yourself and you use this and use that, if you sweat, you know, everything becomes so messy and so bad. And I like fresh air. And she wants to go to the class. And now the lecturer is there. All the other students are there. And then she decides that, well, today I'll just go in shorts and then I'll have, excuse me, you know, you, you see it every time. So you shouldn't have problem with my mentioning it. If you have any problem, you have mentioned, you have problem with the people that you see, not the person that tells you, look at them. <laughs> you understand? So uh, they just say, uh, wear the bra and, uh, you know, nothing else. And they go to the class. And you say, what's the problem? It's like uh, today I'm feeling so hot and it's humid and hot and I don't like, you know, this kind of thing. And you know, after all, this is university situation. There is liberty and freedom. Ah, look at this. Look up here. As I'm doing like this, I'm swinging my hand. I have liberty. But my liberty stops at the tip of your nose. I can box all the air. Anything I want to do, I can do. I have liberty until my hand hits your nose. That's where my liberty stops. You have liberty to do what you want, but your liberty stops until your liberty is going to destroy me. It's going to distract the attention of the whole class. It's going to take their mind away from the lecture, from what they are hearing. And the lecturer is going to be distracted. He's a human being. It's not a stone. Therefore, our liberty, we measure our liberty with the liberty of other people too. And we're considerate. And we think about other people. That's why you think about your influence. And you think about the impact. What I am doing now, the way I am dressing now, how does it affect others? What example? Am I showing? What influence am I having? What impact will it have on the people immediately around me, on the younger ones that see me too? So Jesus said, in this place, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that Jezebel to seduce, look at that word, to seduce, to entice my servants to commit fornication. When people begin to have lust in their hearts just by seeing you pass, when you are passing, uh -uh, as we are here, you know, everybody, you are going your way, I'm going my way, and, uh, you know, you are moving, and then somebody sees you, and it turns the neck. And they've been seeing other people, they didn't turn the neck. What's the problem with you? What are you looking for? What's your goal? What's your aim? What do you want? You must determine what you want, why you do what you do. That's why it says, because this Jezebel is enticing and seducing, my servants think about that good people, good people can be tempted. The servants of the Lord, he said, good people, righteous people, morally sound people. From what they see, you can weaken them. And you can destroy them. That's why that beauty then, that God will not approve of. The beauty that concerned mothers will not approve of. The beauty that only the panel of men and women from Sodom and Gomorrah will approve of. 
The kind of uh, dressing and appearance that only the panel of Satan, fallen angels and unclean spirits will approve of. Or the kind of uh, panel, that the kind of dressing that only the panel of pop stars and entertainers will approve of. That's not good. It's not good enough. You want to ask yourself, who do you really want to impress? Who do you want to impress? Let's say, for example, now you have uh, you know, somebody here who is significant in society and is, you know, he's made it in life and is rich and respected, honored, exalted. Then there is another one here, he never do well, he drop out, a non-entity, doesn't even know how to spell his name. You have this important person here, you have this one here, he's just existing, he's not living. And then I say, come out here, and I want you to impress just one of them. I'll be surprised. You go to the side of the non-entity, and they never do well, and they drop out. And, and the one that doesn't even know how to write his name, and if you give him a spoon to eat, he'll not know whether to hold it with the right hand or the left hand. And then you say, that's the one I want to impress. I say, good luck to you. Something is wrong with you. But you are good, good people here. I said you are good, good people here. You want to impress the people that matter. The people that are significant, those are the people to impress. You don't want to waste your time wanting to impress the never do well. Think about it. You younger ladies here, what kind of husband do you want to get married to? Because if your uh, kind of dressing, if it has lost, if it has some evil in it, and if you, if you know the kind of person that will impress, if that's the person you want to get married to, what's the future for you? You want to impress the people that are sensible, the people that are reasonable, the people that have values in their lives, and the people that matter in society, and the people that matter, and the people that are significant, the people that are reasonable, they are not impressed. Pressed when you show everything you ought to cover up in your body. They are not impressed at all. If you want to impress good, good people, think about it. How should I dress? How should I appear? That will impress reasonable people, good people, righteous people, significant people. The people we call uh, VIP. I don't mean the VIP that parks car right there. And then a little boy comes and says, sir, Look at this photograph. Do you like this one? I'll go and call her for you. I don't, those ones, are they VIP? Not at all. A VIP that brings a car there and is looking for photograph. And HIV does not show inside photograph. I see it on Bebo. They say, no, they show for face. Is that a VIP? So if you want to impress good, good people, there is a way you will appear. Before I go to point number two, look at this. Our present day deceptive beauty is number one, disgraceful. Deceptive beauty is disgraceful. Number two, it is dehumanizing. It dis dehumanizes us. The kind of appearance we have that will dehumanize us, that's not good enough. Number three, disgraceful. Disgraceful. So you want to measure your appearance with these words. Is it disgraceful? Cut it off. Is it dehumanizing? Say no to it. Is it disagreeable? Then reject it. Number four, disease distributing. A kind of appearance that the ultimate thing that will happen is that it will give disease to other people and also will give disease to you. Cut it off. It is destructive. Number five, number six, it's devilish and demonic. Devilish and demonic. Number seven, damnable. It will damn your soul in hellfire. That's why you want to get rid of it. I come to point number two, desirable beauty desirable beauty. When we say something is desirable, it means it is pleasing. It is helpful. That's it. You are considerate of others. That's good. It's friendly. It is lovely. It is congenial. It is satisfying. Desirable beauty. 
And to manifest desirable beauty, there are some things we need to get rid of. I'll tell you later. But look at Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. I'm reading from verse 7. It says, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him. You can put her there to have created her. For my glory, I have formed him. Yea, yes, I have made him. It tells us here that we must realize that God made us. And because God made us, he had a purpose in mind. What purpose did he have in mind? That you will bring glory to him. That you will honor him. That anything you do, everything you do, from the dressing to the appearance, to the talking, to the studying, to the lifestyle, to the character, the morals, everything will bring glory to the Lord. I mean, if it's going to bring glory to the Lord, then it must start from the inside. If you look at uh, Matthew chapter 23 again, verse 26. Matthew chapter 23, verse 26, thou blind Pharisee, blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within, within the cup and of the platter. Then if you do that, it says that the outside of them may be clean also. You see the double side there. If we're going to have desirable beauty, the inside is clean. And then the outside is clean. Desirable beauty. Sometimes if you've been on the, on the road, uh, look up here, um, young people. You are traveling. And you see far ahead of you, on the side of the road, as you are moving like this, there's a bend. There's a corner there. And then it looks like the terrain is a little bit lifted up. And then you see beautiful, beautiful um, side there. It's like the flowers are there. And it's like, uh, you know, the grass is there. And you cannot remove your eyes. So just looking at it, this is great. This is good at a distance. And then as you travel nearer and nearer. And then because it's a bend, the driver slows down. As he slows down, he comes to that exact spot and then... You look at it very well. As you look at it very well, because now you are very near, all you can see, there are some cans of uh, empty cans of this and that thrown there, and some rubbles and some dirty things, and then some flowers grew out of the dirt and some grass. You are disappointed. Is this what I was looking at at a distance? And it looked very beautiful at a distance, and then the nearer you go, the uglier it becomes. Am I telling you something? Am I telling you that some of these ladies will see them far away as we're traveling in the journey of life? And while they're far away from us, how charming and nice and beautiful and slim and skimpy and everything they look, they, and they're very smart and the way they walk and everything, you say, this is great. Wait until you get near. Because when you see at a far distance and you're not very familiar with them, you don't understand. You think they're so nice. They know more than I know what they're living with. They know more than I know the sorrow and the heartache. And they know that what they're trying to do is to cover up a lot of dirty things inside that they're seeing. Some of them even want to commit suicide. It's just making bold face. But that's why we're here. That this thing that is not beautiful but appears beautiful tonight, Almighty God will turn your life around. Yeah. And will make you really, really beautiful. Everybody say, beautiful. Now, but you're beautiful on the inside, and then it spills over onto the outside, and then you become really beautiful. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, here it tells us, it says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his outward countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. But man looketh, for man looketh on the outward appearance. But God looketh, the Lord looketh on the heart. 
Now, if you're going to have desirable beauty, here is what we need. We need to get rid of some things. If we're going to have desirable beauty. And we start from the inside. When we're cleansed on the inside, and we're lovely on the inside, and we're beautiful on the inside, in our thoughts, in our thinking of other people, in our interaction, relationship with other people, when we're beautiful on the inside, it will beam on your face, it will show on your face, it will reflect on your face, and you'll be beautiful on the outside. And then what you put on, the way you dress, will be determined by the condition of your heart. And if the condition of our heart is going to become better, we need to get rid of this. Number one, pride. Pride. Nobody can talk to me. I can make my own choice. Let everybody keep quiet. What concerns them with my life? Pride. Let's get rid of that. You can't live without other people. And your other people are taking care of you. We're responsible for your safety, for security, for your education, for everything. Reciprocate. Pay back. We listen to you. Listen to us too. And we make some allowance for you. We make some provision for you. Reciprocate. And don't just stand in the isolated ivory tower there. Nobody can talk to me, but you talk to us. When you talk to us, adult people, and we don't listen, how do you feel? Reciprocate. And give us the joy that the way we listen to you, you too, you want to listen to us and get rid of number one, what? Pride. Number two, passion passion. What I mean by passion here is the anger or the resentment against the adult society because we perceive the adult society as over controlling us. And we was, I didn't even want to dress bad before, but this adult society, they put mouth in everything. They talk about everything. If you put leg here, put, take your leg. If you dress like this, remove that one. If they say, they say it's not long enough, okay. In reaction against the control of the adult society, this is what I will do. The one that they say is even short, I cut it shorter. Let them talk. Let them say. The passion, the anger, the resentment, the reaction against the adult society, repent of that. Repent of that. And understand, put yourself in the shoes of these concerned mothers. They've seen enough. They've heard enough. And they've experienced enough to know that it will destroy us if we're going like that. Number three, peculiarity. You know, there are some people that don't like to be uniform. They say, I don't want to be, I want to be myself. I want to be myself. And I want to be different in everything. You cannot be different in everything. Now, we say that the exam here in Unilag, we're going to have it in about two, we postponed it two weeks, uh, in two weeks' time. We're going to have it. And I don't like uniformity. When the other people are taking exam, I'm, I'm not going to show up. I'm going to show them I am peculiar. You will fail. <laughs> there are things we have to agree with everybody else. We cannot be peculiar in everything. And if you think that I'm going to be peculiar, and therefore, I will do it this way. It doesn't work. This is a society where there are some things that will be predictable. There are some things that are just put there and we're just lined up. And we say, this is an area I cannot be peculiar. Number four, perversion. Perversion. We get rid of that, of that. Then number five, look at this. Peer pressure. Peer pressure. I'm surprised. The people that react to us are adults. And we are more reasonable than your age mate. We're more reasonable than the people that have not got any certificate in life. And we tell you something. We even try to put pressure on you. You don't yield to our pressure. But when it is the pressure of your age mate, that one you cannot resist. You must be a, an example to them paradigm, a model to them. Do not allow every dick and hurry to influence your life. Influence them too. 
and you will influence them. You will be a major influence in your community. Why is it that everything that happens around you must control you, must influence you? Be free of that peer pressure. Number six, provocative appearance. You look at the way you dress or the way your friend is dressing and you know this is provocative. It's going to stir up the evil passion in the heart of the opposite sex. Number seven, prostitution. Say no to it. Everybody say no. no. God bless you. Now, point number three, dignifying beauty. Dignifying beauty. This is a kind of beauty appreciated by God himself. Appreciated by important, significant people. You, you look at this in Psalm 45. Psalm 45, reading from verse, um, verse 11. Psalm 45, verse 11. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty. And for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. What a great joy. To just understand, have the assurance in your heart. And what a great joy for the first panel there, the panel of God and the holy angels, to just nod the head as you dress and you come out. And for the Spirit of God in your heart to bear witness and say, you are great and you are doing well. My boy, this is good. My daughter, this is good. For the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords, so approve of your appearance, the way you appear outside. And for the Spirit of the Lord to be saying, you are a good reflection of who you belong to. A good reflection of the family you come from. A good reflection of the good training that your parents have given you. And then the king, the king of kings, greatly delighting and desiring your beauty. And then it says, for he is thy Lord, and you worship him. Have you noticed that any time some of these uh, people had a chance to come before the king, they always change their dressing, check up. Because when Pharaoh had his dream, then they said there's somebody in the prison that will uh, be able to interpret your dream. And this, who is that? Do you know the person? Joseph. He said, go and call him. I read in the Bible that immediately they called Joseph and he said, the king is calling you. He said, wait. He shaved, he washed, and he changed his clothes. I said, Joseph, why are you doing that? I want the king to greatly delight in my appearance. Dignifying appearance. Dignifying a kind of, uh, you know, beauty. What if I came here tonight and I didn't wear a jacket, I didn't wear a tie, I didn't wear a shirt, and uh, singlet, I didn't wear singlet. And then when I was coming, somebody said, Sir, where do you think you are? Well, I said, this is campus. And he says, why are you like this? I learned there's freedom here. And if you are free, I ought to be free. No cheating now. <laughs> Would that be acceptable? No. That's why Joseph, when the king called him, he changed his appearance. Because he wanted to have a dignifying appearance. That's what the Lord is telling us. That the Lord God of heaven, he sees you everywhere you are. In the hostel, and on the road, and in the lecture hall. Everywhere you go. Or is God only present on Sunday when we go to service? No, he's present everywhere. Let the king of kings delight in your beauty. In uh, Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs Chapter 31, I'm looking at verse 22. She maketh herself coverings. You cover yourself. Coverings of tapestry. Her clothing was silk and purple. You see that dignifying woman here? How she clothed herself. In verse 25, strength and honor are her clothing. Let there be some honor in your clothing. Let there be some dignity in your clothing, the way you appear. So people don't look down on you as if you are a ruffian, as if you are a prostitute, and you are an educated person, enlightened person, a refined person. Let people see the kind of person you are by the way you appear. 
Let me read this last reference to you before I give you some couple of words and then we're through. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, reading from verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Just as you go back uh, home, now they say you go back to the hostel, uh, look at your wardrobe and look at what you have there and say, is this dignifying? Is this befitting? Is this God honoring? Is this glorifying to God? Is this an appearance of evil? Does it make me to look like Jezebel? Does it make me to look like Judas? Does it make me to look like people that want other people to be destroyed? What do we do? So that we can have a kind of appearance, a kind of dressing, a kind of outlook that is befitting, that is glorifying to God, that is honoring to God. Seven words. Number one, realize. You've come to this place today. And all of us who are watching by satellite, you've heard it today. And we're breathing together. And there is no secret in it. There's no great theory in this. This is very plain to everyone. We realize. I realize I've been wrong. I realize I've not been very thoughtful in my dressing. I realize I've not been very considerate. I realize I've not done it the way I ought to do it. Number one, realize. Number two, repent. It means if I know that I'm going on a journey and uh, somebody waved me down and he said, looks like uh, you're not on the right road. I said, what do you mean? Where are you going? And then I mention my destination. And he says, this is not the road. They've cancelled uh, this road. Actually, if you keep on going, you'll discover that when you get over on the other side, there is a dead end. And then he points out the way. He says, if you really want to get to the place you are going, this is the way. Where are we going? I want to be happy. I want to be successful. I want to be fulfilled. I want to be significant. I want people to respect me. And I want life to deal well with me. That's why I came to university. That's why I'm studying. That's why I'm here. And I want the destination to be happy and joyful and fulfilled and prosperous and blessed. And then somebody tells me, but look at the road you are taking. This road does not lead to the place you are going. The road you take now with this kind of dressing, with this kind of appearance, this road will lead to disease, destruction. Devastation, damnation, hellfire. Ah, I don't want to go there. Okay, this is the way. You turn around. That's your, rep your repent. You turn away from everything that is evil. When you repent like that, are you doing me a favor? <laughs> you know, look at this child. This child, something happened at home. And then we put food on the table. We say, my daughter, come and eat. No, I don't want to eat. Why? I'm not happy with mommy. I'm going to punish mommy today. <laughs> okay, please come and eat. Okay, mommy, I'm going to do you a favor. I will eat. <laughs> Are you doing mommy a favor or you're doing your tummy a favor? When you repent, you're not doing the pastor a favor. You're doing a favor to yourself. Number one, realize. Number two, repent. Number three, receive. You receive the forgiveness of God. Come on to me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He'll give you rest and peace and joy. Your life will never be the same again. You will make it in life. Something good is going to happen to you. Number four, resolve. You resolve. I've been going the way of destruction. Now I realize. Now I repent. Now I receive the forgiveness of God. And I resolve not to go that evil way anymore. Number five, reclose yourself in a new kind of garment. Reclose yourself in a new kind of apparel or clothing that is honoring to God from now on. Number six, resist. The temptation will still come. Your friends will try to say, uh-uh, what's happening to you? Mary, mother of Jesus, uh, thank you, that's who I am. I'm happy you recognize that. That's my goal. That's what I want to be. They may make fun, but you resist all their jesting. And you resist all they are trying to bring you back into the evil way. Number seven, reflect. You reflect God's glory and reflect man's dignity. We are born and destined to reign and we shall reign 
we are here on this campus and you are there my daughter my boy on that other campus where you see and where you are listening to me now there's something good waiting for you and you'll get to the top in jesus name and that place will to reach will not allow some of these little little things to hinder us and take us back we're going to do right we're going to act right we're going to say no to evil and we're going to act right in the name of the lord and by the help of the lord in jesus name i am going to the top are you one of us are you going there rise up and tell the lord you've had something today you want the impact of what you have heard to actually make meaning in your life and you're going to take decision tonight you're going to take decision tonight number one you realize number two you repent number three you receive the forgiveness of god just tell the lord lord i am sorry for the things i've done wrong for the way i've acted wrong for the way i've appeared wrong in the public I've dressed wrong in the public. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I receive the forgiveness of God. I receive the salvation of God. And I resolve. I resolve. I make up my mind. From now on, I will not move. I will not go that wrong direction again. I resolve. God helping me. God helping me. I resolve. Number five, I reclose myself. Reclose myself. Garments of praise. Robe of salvation. The clothing of righteousness. By his grace, I'm going to resist every solicitation to evil. Now I'm going to reflect God's glory everywhere I go. The way I dress, the way I talk, the people I move with, the company I keep, I will reflect God's glory. Amen. Everybody say, Amen. The message today concerns every one of us everyone so what we're going to do all of us in unity together we're going to raise up our hands and we're going to say lord today we come in agreement you and i as a team together we can change condition on this campus i said we can change conditions on this campus you will do your part i will do my part and we come into this agreement together that today, the Lord will forgive us for what we have done unknowingly, ignorantly in the past. All of us, as God forgives us, he's going to give us strength. We will march on in unity. We will stand for righteousness. Together, we will say no to everything that is evil. And even if I have to sacrifice a little, and you have to sacrifice a little, we're going to sacrifice together. We must bring this campus, that campus, all those campuses, all of us together in unity. We must bring the campus out of this situation we find ourselves. And it will be done. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you in unity today. And uh, everyone here, those who are just giving their lives to the Lord now, and those who have given their lives to the Lord before, we come in agreement together. We repent in Jesus' name. All the compromise, all the yielding and the succumbing to the pressure around us, forgive us in Jesus' name. You said it, my people who are called by my name will seek my face turn from their wicked ways and pray i will forgive them i will heal their land we are praying lord forgive us in jesus name give us the inner strength to stand for righteousness give us the inner strength the stamina to stand for what is true why should the unbelievers why should the careless people lead the way and then lead us astray we will lead the way and we will lead the campus back to the path of righteousness. Give us the grace. Give us the strength. Give us the spiritual energy. Lord, we are equal to the task. It shall be done. Together, we say no to evil. Together, we say yes to righteousness. 
together we will serve you. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said. Now we're still going to pray. Our exams are coming and you know, you want to be strong and prepared for that exam. And how many of you know that we're going to pass? We're going to make it. That the Lord is going to help us. No bad luck. No failure. The Lord will assist you. You believe? You believe? Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you touch everyone right now. Anywhere there is sickness, infirmity, or weakness, or bad dreams, or oppression, or yoke, break everything in Jesus' name. Touch your children. I pray that you heal your children. Deliver them from every attack and every evil. And this exam in front of us, as they prepare, direct them. As they read, direct them. And give them retentive memory. And as they get into the exam hall, no panicking. No fear. No misreading of questions. Make their brains sharp and attentive. So they'll be able to write the right thing. Lord, we have come to the time when we accept distinction for those who are following you. For those who have repented and are living righteousness. And without any exam practice, Lord, your people will succeed. I pray, Lord, you confirm the miracle for everyone in Jesus' name. Bless everyone, Lord, that every day will be a day of joy. And everything in our lives will be leading us to the top. Where we'll be able to rule and reign and we'll be able to influence our country, our community for the Lord. I pray, Lord, all these who are here today, if Jesus tarries, as we see one another in the future, we'll say, praise the Lord, I made it. We will make it in Jesus' name. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much and God bless you.